Hello, this is Al Koritz. I am Applications and Service Manager with Electron Microscopy Sciences. Today we will be doing an overview of the E3100 critical point dryer made by Quorum Industries. We represent Quorum here in the United States. Uh, we sell a lot of these. Actually, uh, this model actually dates back to the mid 80s. It's a quite simple, uh, um, strictly mechanical design, completely manual, uh, and therefore is uh, relatively uh, trouble free from uh, uh, issues that more advanced computer controlled units. Uh, might present. So first I'll give you an overview of the different items. Some of the things that uh, will come out of the box of course first is the E3100 critical point dryer. Uh, it has a pressure manometer uh, that's scaled both in pounds per square inch PSI and bar. There's a thermometer uh, which is important. It allows you to know what the temperature is of the critical point dryer so you can achieve that critical uh, temperature and pressure where you get the phase transition and your sample uh, water content uh, transitions from liquid water to gaseous water without any damage uh, to the sample. You get two lengths of plastic tubing which attach here and then one in the back of the chamber that you can't see so well. One's a water inlet, one's a water outlet. It really doesn't make a difference uh, uh, on how you want to uh, connect it. You see also two valves on top. One will be a uh, gas inlet valve which will connect to the CO2 tank. The CO2 tank is a special tank. It has something called a siphon tube or a dip tube which delivers liquid CO2 unlike the standard tanks which only will uh, provide you gaseous CO2. In addition to the, that, the tubing you have a connection line which goes from uh, either of these top two valves. Uh, you can take your pick. I always use the front valve uh, uh, since I use, that one is used a bit more frequently. Uh, this is an international setup. Uh, so this particular fitting as it comes out of the box is set up more for uh, tank configurations from other parts of the world. So we provide an adapter piece uh, you would put Teflon tape around it just to make uh, the threads get lubricated a little bit and wear better. Uh, also provides a better seal and you would get two wrenches and tighten these two fittings together. Now another important item is this small nylon washer. A little difficult to see in the palm of my hand because it's uh, almost clear. This nylon washer goes inside the coupling and then this makes the seal to the liquid CO2 tank containing the dip tube. Um, I also put uh, uh, Teflon tape on the tank uh, uh, male part of the fitting. Uh, so again, it's easy on the threads and it makes a very good seal.
The other items that you'll receive uh, in the package is a, a bunch of spare parts, uh, O-ring seals, uh, gaskets, uh, those sort of items. You will also receive a spare safety burst membrane and the copper seal. Uh, this is a safety device. If you overpressurize it uh, uh, by accident, uh, uh, for whatever the reason, uh, this will burst at 1825 psi, um, safely venting the contents of the chamber uh, out this port uh, that's on the back of the uh, the stand here. It's also important that you attach your system to the bench. It has two threaded holes. Uh, this way uh, this very heavy unit does not uh, move around so much. Uh, it, it, I believe me it's, it's quite heavy. Um, okay so the other items in the bag here is a steel bar called the Tommy Bar, which we take and we put through the hole on the cover on the back bore and allow us to unscrew the back bore uh, so we can use the instrument. Quite a Quite a number of threads on it. It comes out, it has an o-ring seal on it and you always want to make sure that that o-ring is is clean. Inside the unit is uh, a chamber which can hold several uh, samples. Uh, of course, this is all dependent on what kind of samples you're working with. Um, you just may want to lot, layer samples in these grooves uh, in the device. Um, but you have the ability to put them in these baskets. Now, critical point drying requires not only the use of CO2, uh, but an intermediate fluid, uh, usually it's, it's ethanol because that's what you dehydrate your sample in. Some material science uh, users may use some other compounds. Uh, if you're going to use acetone, I'll just let you know that uh, um, it has special gaskets in it, that, like the O-ring on the back, that is acetone resistant and I say resistant uh, because eventually it will uh, with the pressure and the acetone uh, the o-rings will start to leak and need to be uh, replaced but you can put your intermediate fluid in this trough keeping your samples wet and slide the whole thing uh, into the chamber with this pin pointing out. And underneath, when you slide this forward, there's a, a, a button which actually opens a valve, that little pinhole, it drains all the alcohol out of your sample, which you'll see during the actual uh, operation uh, uh, of, this, of the system. Um, that brings me to this back valve, which is the drain valve. Uh, so you uh, let your CO2 enter, uh, your alcohol drains out the bottom when you do some flushing with, uh, uh, with the CO2. Uh, then you keep this valve closed for the remainder of the process. And when it comes time to bleed the pressure off, you use this back valve. So that's essentially the overview of the system. Uh, now we'll get it set up uh, for operation. 
Uh, I might add that, as I said, that this is a completely uh, manual system. Uh, when it comes out of the box, it does not have the thermometer installed. Um, all I usually do is put a little bit of o-ring grease in there just to, to make it slide in uh, very easily. Uh, you line up uh, the pin with the holes and uh, uh, you're good to go. Uh, you connect your water in and your water out to a recirculating pump uh, usually uh, or a hot and cold water source. Um, I find that uh, um, if you get a recirculating heater which can both cool uh, to at least 4 degrees Celsius but you want a little bit more capacity than that because this is quite a lot of mass to cool down so you want to cool it down as low as you can I usually try to shoot for 5 degrees Celsius the lowering of the temperature allows you to pack more CO2 into the chamber and make it easier to achieve that critical pressure that you need. Um, if you load it at room temperature, you get a lot less uh, liquid CO2 in the system uh, and you may have to heat it a little bit hotter than uh, normal. Uh, to achieve uh, the 1071 PSI or 71 bar pressure, uh, which is the critical uh, point uh, at 30, 31.5 degrees Celsius uh, for carbon dioxide. The other two items that you'll find in this bag is a thumb drive with the operating instructions uh, for the system uh, on the lanyard and uh, this device which is actually used to remove the front window and service the o-rings behind it. Uh, I highly recommend that you don't do this on your own. Uh, that you send the instrument in if it uh, develops a leak uh, and needs servicing uh, because of uh, sometimes if you over tighten or under tighten uh, if you under tighten of course you, under high pressure you might get uh, some fluid leak and not be able to achieve the critical pressure if you over tighten it you may actually damage or crack the sapphire glass that's behind this uh, Lexan safety cover on the front. Remember, we're working with high pressures, over a thousand PSI, um, so uh, it's possible if misused and the safety systems are bypassed, uh, it, you know, you could result in some injury. So. Uh, that's why there's protective glass and that's why I highly recommend you send your instrument in to uh, EMS uh, to be serviced. Uh, uh, I've been working with this particular critical point dryer since the mid 80s. Um, I know it fairly well um, and have serviced it uh, for quite some time also. As I explained uh, previously, this is the sample holder. You would put your samples uh, in the little baskets and fill the trough to the top so your samples stay underneath the surface of the intermediate fluid because you're trying to prevent air drying. Then you would check and make sure the sealing surface is clean, make sure the o-ring is clean, and you would insert this into the back and then you would put the door on and the door would interface with that button and as you screw it closed 
it would allow the CO2 to start to drain and you want to use a moderate amount of force uh, you'll sort of have to get used to this but it, it really won't go any further and the idea is that we don't want a long uh, bar for you to uh, over torque uh, the back of the fitting uh, once pressurized uh, this will become virtually uh, irremovable and you'll not be able to open it in a previous video I showed you all the basic components of the E3100 critical point dryer uh, all the different uh, valves and uh, such um, now I have it hooked up uh, to a rather primitive uh, heat exchanger here in my laboratory and since I don't work with these very often and they don't come in for repair frequently uh, I'm not going to spend the money for a uh, expensive heating recirculating system that has the capacity of cooling uh, fluid down to uh, uh, at least 4 degrees Celsius, 5 degrees Celsius or even lower if I use uh, uh, something like uh, antifreeze or ethylene di uh, glycol as a uh, circulating cooling media. Uh, here I'm just using water uh, that's in all these tubes. Um, I have a, a used uh, recirculator pump, a peristaltic pump that I, I got off of eBay. Uh, it serves the purpose uh, quite well to circulate the fluid. Um, I have uh, uh, the cooling or warming uh, fluid circulation output going into the peristaltic pump. This is the output side. Around back here I have a styrofoam cooler with a piece of quarter inch or six millimeter uh, refrigeration copper tubing to act as a heat exchanger. I just uh, made a coil and I connected the in and out lines. Uh, in this uh, styrofoam bucket I put a little bit of uh, cold water to start and what I'll do is I'll top it off with ice cubes um, to make the water temperature go down to 4 degrees. It does take quite a bit of time for this mass to, uh, to cool down to 4 degrees uh, but you should get it as cold as possible because then you can uh, fill the chamber with as much liquid CO2 as possible which makes uh, raising the pressure to achieve critical point and pressure uh, all that much easier. Uh, I've made a connection with the CO2 line to the front valve as I described previously. Uh, this is the drain valve which we'll use first to remove the intermediate fluid inside the pressure chamber which is usually ethanol but also sometimes you can use acetone. Normally this output would go to some sort of uh, drain or a fume hood uh, where that fluid uh, will uh, be collected in a bucket and you know not leak all over the bench top. So for demonstration purposes I will not be using an intermediate fluid because I don't have a drain set up. Uh, this rear valve will be used as an exhaust valve to decompressurize the, uh, the CPD chamber uh, once we reach critical temperature and pressure. Um, so from there uh, we've got our CO2 tank with a dip tube or also known as a siphon tube. The CO2 will come down and I'll fill the chamber and visualize the level uh, which should be 
about three quarters of the way up the sight glass is where, where I want it. Normally with an intermediate fluid you would do several. Uh, you, would, uh, you would add some CO2, let the level come up, open the drain, releasing as much of the intermediate fluid, i.e. ethanol in, in most cases, into your collection bucket. Close the valve, open it, let some more CO2 in. Uh, when the level goes up to about halfway, uh, uh, you let it sit and sort of equilibrate, uh, uh, let the alcohol and CO2 mingle and diffuse and make a uh, homogeneous mixture. Open the valve again. You do this several times until you're certain you've got all that intermediate fluid out. Um, that is a necessary step to get a, a proper critical point dried sample out at the end. Once you've removed all of that intermediate fluid, then uh, you make sure that your temperature is uh, about five, 5 or 6 degrees, uh, as cold as you can get it. Fill the chamber uh, about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way up. Um, you, your starting pressure should be over 50 bar and that's the minimum pressure required in order to successfully use this. Uh, also it's helpful to know how much CO2 is left in your tank and in many instances uh, people buy a ordinary household scale that you would weigh yourself on uh, from like Walmart uh, put the full tank on the scale, get a weight, and then at some point uh, the tank will be empty, you will no longer be able to fill the chamber with liquid CO2, and then you take and you compare the weight now to the weight full, and this way you can have an idea how much CO2 is left in your tank and how many um, uh, processes you can run on one cylinder of liquid CO2. Um, also, the gas companies don't take the best of care with the tanks. Um, uh, sometimes it's useful to uh, install a, uh, a dirt and uh, rust filter uh, up here, but that's that's not going to be a discussion of this video. That way you get clean C, uh, CO2 with no, uh, no rust or dirt from whatever might be at the bottom of that cylinder. So what I'll do now is uh, I will get some ice and put it in the uh, bucket and start the, uh, the peristaltic pump and get this uh, down from Right now it's at almost 22 degrees Celsius. I'm going to get it as cold as I can. Generally I like to work around 5 degrees and then we'll uh, introduce CO2 and move forward from there. Okay, the ice is in the bucket and we'll begin to cool the heat exchanger. Uh, so I am starting uh, the cooling process now. This will, this will take some time depending on you know your setup and uh, how efficient your cooling system is. This system is not terribly efficient. Uh, uh, however, uh, it serves my purpose. Okay, about uh, 25 minutes has gone by and I'm at 6 degrees, uh, uh, which I consider uh, close enough uh, for demonstration purposes. So while uh, cooling the chamber I am going to 
open the tank valve supplying liquid CO2 down the transfer line into up to this uh, valve that it's attached to I am going to uh, open that valve and I can see liquid CO2 entering the system see the uh, fluid level rise. I'm getting it up over the top of the sample boat. You can see the manometer is reading about 70, 50, 60 bar pressure. I'm closing the valve. Now if I was running a sample, I would open the bottom drain valve back here and let most of the CO2 and the ethanol drain out then I would repeat this filling process uh, until all the intermediate fluid was removed from the chamber but for demonstration purposes uh, I'm not going to waste CO2 nor uh, time and I'm just going to let the pressure uh, sit where it is and we're going to prepare to start heating the chamber. As you can see the temperature now is about 11 degrees Celsius and rising as well as the pressure is rising inside the chamber. I've replaced the ice water with uh, rather hot water. So I can get the pressure to go up over 31 Celsius. Generally, I like to get it about 35 Celsius. Um, during this demonstration, uh, I'll actually raise the pressure to about 100 bar. Uh, remember, you only need 71 bar pressure to achieve critical pressure uh, for CO2 in this device. And uh, I take it up to 100 uh, to test the system. Uh, prior to shipping it back to the customer to make sure that it achieves uh, the pressures required as well as uh, temperature. Um, again, I've got a, uh, uh, a rather inefficient uh, heat exchanger, but we're already at 50, 60, 75 bar pressure. So we've already achieved the critical pressure point and we're at uh, uh, about 25 Celsius. So right now, we're, because of the mass of the chamber, there's a lag in temperature compared to pressure. So you just want to keep the pressure above your 71 bar needed or 1070 PSI because right now we're uh, approaching 1200 PSI and we're close to 30 degrees Celsius. Now sometimes depending on uh, sample and system you will see the cr so-called critical opalescence uh, take place uh, where the CO2 becomes cloudy momentarily and it changes from liquid phase to gas phase. I don't know if we'll see that this time. We're, we're past the critical pressure and we're past the critical temperature. Uh, we're at uh, 33 Celsius. The critical temperature is 31.5 for CO2. We're approaching 1350 PSI in the chamber.
So once you've uh, surpassed the critical point in, in temperature, uh, depending on your sample, you may wish to hold this temperature and pressure for a while. Uh, you certainly don't want to try to add CO2 by opening this valve. Uh, the way you do it is control the temperature, uh, keep the temperature uh, high, therefore if the system is very tight like this one, it's at 100 bar. Uh, I am not going any any higher than 100 bar. We've already achieved uh, 38 Celsius and uh, 1,000 bar pressure, almost 1,500 psi. The safety burst mechanism in the base, as I told you, is set. Uh, as a safety function at 1850 PSI so there's no reason to tempt fate so you will keep uh, the temperature uh, on the warm side and now you will slowly less than 100 PSI per minute open the rear gas exhaust valve which you see my hand on behind the inlet valve and you will slowly start releasing pressure while maintaining temperature now I'm doing this a little bit more rapidly than I normally would uh, you can also purchase uh, with the system an inline flow meter so you can uh, get the flow rates correct but I'm also uh, at this particular moment trying not to exceed 1500 PSI so I'm at 42 Celsius just trying to open the valve to maintain 100 psi that is really the upper limit you should uh, never exceed uh, I like to give your give everybody a little bit of headroom over the safety burst membrane You can moderate uh, the temperature if you have a temperature controlled bath, but since I'm just using nearly boiling water that I, I got from a, a kettle uh, in the heat exchanger, um, it's a little tough for me to control uh, uh, temperature. So right now I'm just bleeding a little gas off at a time. not to exceed that 100 bar and as long as you can keep the temperature and pressure above that critical uh, point 71 bar pressure 1070 psi approximately and 31 and a half degrees celsius you've achieved your uh, critical point drying uh, procedure uh, and as i said really the only thing left to do is maintain the temperature and slowly bleed off pressure at less than 100 psi a minute so if you're at 1500 psi you should uh, slowly uh, it should take 15 or 20 minutes to get back to atmospheric pressure. Okay, here we are. We're still slowly bleeding off the pressure. We're down to almost 1300 PSI at uh, about 45 degrees Celsius. And again, if for whatever your process requires uh, 
for your traditional biological material which has been processed and dehydrated and such, you shouldn't have to maintain it any longer than 10 or 15 minutes above the critical pressure and temperature for other material science applications. I know some labs like to maintain uh, uh, pressure and temperature over the critical point uh, during an overnight period. Now I always must caution everybody that leaving a highly pressurized vessel uh, unattended overnight is not really uh, what you should do um, unless you post uh, adequate warning signs and in the case with this you have some thermal protection that doesn't al allow the temperature to, to go above a certain point limiting the amount of pressure in the chamber um, but uh, this would be difficult to achieve without putting in a, a, a digital thermal couple that was attached to uh, a, some sort of cooling circuit or a heating chilling recirculator some sort of closed loop feedback system um, that would uh, not allow it to exceed uh, the maximum pressure of the burst membrane which is 1850 uh, PSI. So again we're we're still above the critical temperature and we're slowly bleeding off pressure and we'll rejoin this in a little while. Okay, as you can see, we're approaching uh, the critical pressure level again, again on the downswing, slowly venting. It's hard to hear the venting. A lot of times you can, you know, like I said, there's a flow meter that you can put on this, or you just have the line going to a beaker with bubbles, and uh, you can just monitor the amount of bubbles that it's making. Uh, remember that this is letting uh, extra CO2 in the environment, so if you don't have uh, adequate ventilation, you might find yourself uh, uh, feeling quite fatigued, and if you're in a very enclosed space, uh, you could deplete uh, oxygen in the room, so take care with that. You can see the temperature is still about 40 Celsius, well above the critical temperature of 31.5 Celsius. So right now we're on perfect track for having some nicely critical buoyant dried samples. So we will come back uh, when we're closer to being uh, able to open the device. I've shut the recirculating pump down because we're still uh, at 40 degrees. Like I said, this is a large thermal mass, difficult to get cold, but once it gets hot, it's stable. You can hear that as the pressure goes down, the, the amount of gas coming forth from the exhaust uh, changes, and this is where it requires some monitoring. You can hear, without me turning the valve that the gas flow is slowing so it requires some vigilance to maintain uh, approximately that 100 psi per minute uh, uh, reduction in pressure and also monitor the temperature you you don't want it to dip below the critical temperature you want to keep the chamber as warm as you can while exhausting uh, all the gas. So we'll come back to this uh, when we're closer to atmosphere. All right, we're uh, nearing atmospheric pressure. Notice the temperature is still well above the critical temperature of 31.5 Celsius. Uh, you always want to make sure that your 
chamber is warm to the very end. A word of caution on the valves. At no time should you use uh, a pair of pliers or some other mechanical gripping device to open or close these. These are precision valves. Uh, you will damage them. Uh, never use anything more than your fingers to tighten or close the valve. Uh, if you can hand tighten the valve and it still leaks, well then it's time to have the valve rebuilt. Uh, there are rebuild kits available. Uh, you can take the valve apart and replace all the uh, inner components and that usually solves the problem. Okay, so the hissing has stopped. The manometer reads zero. I'm opening the valve uh, quite a lot to make sure that all the pressures uh, out of the chamber if and only if all the cha pressure has been relieved from the chamber will you be able to unscrew the back and retrieve your now uh, dried samples. So that concludes uh, this video on how to set up and use the E3100 critical point dryer. My name is Al Koritz. I'm the Applications and Service Manager. Uh, my contact information will be at the conclusion of this video. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions at all, um, and I will certainly do my best to help you. Have a good day.